Well, today's subject is going to be a little bit challenging for some of us, especially um, we got one guy on here that's almost celebrating 50 years of marriage. So I'm looking forward to hearing the advice that he's getting ready to provide for us. No pressure there, Dwight. <laughs> and, uh, but the the question that I've had asked by some couples is, um, you know, what do you do if your spouse has become complacent? What do you do? So if you had a friend, what advice would you give to that friend if they said, my spouse has become complacent? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question to answer many times. And, you know, especially if they say to you, you know, we've been listening to the Lord and we've been asking them and, you know, fill in the blank here. You know, we've been asking the Lord, is it time to buy a new house? And we hear him prompting. Yes. Is it time to buy a new car? And they hear prompting. Yes. Or is it time for us to find a church? You know, maybe they've moved to a new area or maybe they got, um, due to COVID, their church disbanded. I don't know. You know, whatever the Holy Spirit's moving, it could be finding a new job or it could be just being more romantic together. You know, these are all what ifs that I, you know, that we're all at some point in our life, the Holy Spirit's going to say, it's time to move. It's time to do something different. I'm moving it's time for you to go with me. Yet, what happens if your spouse, or even worse, you, become complacent? And it ultimately, it's being disobedient to God's prompting. So we all fight that temptation. We all are going to encounter that situation in our life. So what advice would you give to this person that's going through this? Before you answer that, I want to go to God's word so we can see what God has to say about complacency. Um, Zechariah um, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, God said, I will punish the men who are complacent, who say in their hearts, the Lord would not let, and you can just fill in the blank, the Lord would not let my marriage fall apart. Oh, no, no, he loves me too much for that. The Lord won't let my finances fall apart, my reputation fall apart, my job position be taken from me, my health be taken from me, my child be taken from me, my nation be taken from me. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's an Old Testament scripture. That's old covenant teaching. The truth is God will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get you to turn from your ways to his way, truth, and life. This is a New Testament teaching. I'm getting ready to read to you. It's in Hebrews 12, verses, verse 6. The Lord disciplines. That word in Greek means to instruct and correct by training, and it also means to purify. So the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And that also means daughter, too. That word chasten, it's not a word that we often use. And so I looked it up. What did it mean in the original language? It meant he whips or inflicts severe pain to everyone he accepts as his son. Does that mean, you, you know, that he's just going to beat you for, for no reason? No, <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I want you to think about this in the context of what I'm asking. As Christians who have the Holy Spirit living within us, we're called to be watchmen. Now, that concept of watchmen, most of us don't comprehend or relate to, but if you lived in a city where they had city walls, those walls were great because they protected you from oncoming armies that may destroy your family and destroy you or put you in slavery. But the problem with the walls is that it blinded the people inside of the walls. If there was an oncoming army, they wouldn't know it because they couldn't see it. And that's one of the challenges in life with complacency is that you get so fat and satisfied that you don't see beyond the walls. And what do watchmen do? Watchmen, they walk around these walls. They guard the city and they're looking out. They're looking for oncoming danger. And when they see it, it's their job and their responsibility to warn the people within the city that the army's coming so that they can gather their arms and be prepared 
If the watchmen don't do that, then the city can easily be taken over and destroyed. And either the lives of their, the people in the city will be taken or they'll be taken as slaves. And so that's what a watchman does. And people who have the Holy Spirit in them, Christians that have the Holy Spirit in them, they are watchmen, especially to their own families. And I want us to look at Ezekiel 3. And you don't have to turn to it, but, um, but you can if you want to. But it, I'm going to start with um, verse 4, and I'm going to hit some other highlights. And you'll see it on the website if you want to go back to the words that I went to. But then God said, go and speak my words, unyielding, not afraid. Listen carefully to take heart to all the words I speak to you. And this is what God's saying to you and me. As we listen to the thoughts within inside of us, recognizing those thoughts are from him. Go speak those words, unyielding, not afraid. Listen carefully and take heart to all the words I speak to you. I've made you a watchman. If you do not warn or do not speak out to dissuade, I will hold you accountable. Again, when a righteous person turns from their righteousness, this is a good person. It's easy for good people to turn from their righteousness and do evil. I will put a stumbling block before them. But if you do not warn them, I will hold you accountable. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin and they do not sin, they will surely live because they took the warning I gave you and you will save yourself as long with, along with them. There are three things as watchmen that make us good watchmen, especially for our family. First is godly knowledge, then wisdom, then character. Knowledge, look at Joshua, Joshua 1.8. It says, it teaches us to obtain knowledge and to maintain prosperity. It requires us to keep this book of the law always on our lips, meditate on it day and night so that we're careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. See, the key to being prosperous and successful is knowing God's word inside of your heart, knowing the path and the direction and flow that things are called to go. There's also wisdom. There's a whole book of wisdom called Proverbs. And if you look at it, there's 31 chapters, basically designed for one chapter per day. And 11 of those 31 chapters have a section that teach about the sin of complacency or, or slothfulness or laziness. And you can see it even in the first chapter, verse 32, it says the complacency, the ease, the prosperity of fools will destroy them. You know, we obtain wisdom by studying the book of wisdom, and that's Proverbs and all of God's word. And then lastly, character. Hebrews 6, 12, it says, we do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those through faith and patience who inherit what has been promised. Look, there's a huge difference, you guys, between being complacent and being content. And the difference between the two, you see it in um, Philippians, you know, the famous verse, Philippians 4.13, uh, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, a lot of people forget to read the first two, two verses before then. It says, I've learned to be content in every circumstance. The secret to being content in any and every situation is to do all things through him who gives me strength. It's to do all things through God. who's going to give you the power and the strength to do what he's called you to do. Complacency feels more like laziness and not strength. So... To be content has strength involved in it. I don't know if that makes sense. So I want us to dive a little bit deeper into that to, to get greater understanding. So back to my original question. What advice would you give your friend if he came to you and said, my spouse has become complacent? Now, before I open up the tables for you guys to answer that question, I want to remind you guys, 
the measure that we give, the way we judge others, we too will be judged. It's so easy to give someone advice, but just remember the words that we give to somebody, God then applies it to us. So many of the times that what we're asking us, um, you know, this was born out of uh, different clients saying this to me. And today I was just meditating on myself, what I would say. And um, uh, I, I realized that there are some areas that God's speaking this to me on too personally about areas I've been personally complacent on. So I'm opening up the door here. What kind of advice would you give to someone who comes to you and says that their spouse has become complacent, that they hear both of them have heard the promptings from God. They know what they need to do, but they've their spouse has become disobedient to following through with that. What advice would you give? Now I'm going to pause the recording until one of you says that you're ready to answer. So give you a chance to think about it. So Dwight has been the first one, the guy that's almost 50 years of marriage here. Um, uh, well, to begin with, I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> I, I'm still growing. I'm still maturing. And I think, you know, all of us become, place, complac become complacent in a lot of areas in our lives. Um. We have to look at ourselves when we become complacent. Sometimes it's to see what's causing that. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it just unsureness, insecurity? You know, as a as you know, you look at your your mate. They're different than us. They view things different than us. They process things different. Sometimes, you know, we don't do, we might become complacent out of fear that, well, I can't satisfy the other person. You know, I'm, I'm incapable. I have shortcomings. So my thing, if you think your mate's becoming complacent, you know, go to, to God and look at how he loves you, how he loved you when you were unlovable. To be honest, and he laid down his life for you so that he could draw you to him. So in that respect, we need to, to look and see, well, what are their needs? We know that, you know, we can't fulfill all of any person's needs. That has to come from God. But there are certain things that, that we can fulfill. I know, you know, my wife needs security. She needs the confidence that, you know, I'm for her and not against her. You know, that's one of our themes, I think, in this group. It is. You know, it's just like God is for us. We have to be for each other, not against them. They have to know that what we want for them is their best. Not what pleases us, but what is best for them best their best for what god wants you know to give them to bring them into so you know complacency you know you may be in complacent you may be in complacent or even you being complacent you have to do some soul searching within yourself and you have you have to talk with them too but you can't you got to come at it from a point of it's not their problem. Maybe it's my problem. You know, you know, what can I help do to help you overcome the battle that you're facing? You know, I don't know if any of that made sense, but yeah, a lot of it, that's, yeah. that's what I would do. <laughs> well, and so you brought up a good point too, is that, Many times that feeling of, of um, my, you know, that you feel like your spouse is being disobedient to God or, or that they're um, uh, just being complacent. Um, sometimes that feeling in, is actually generated from you and not from the Lord. 
And yeah. it's important to, to know the difference because if, if, if it becomes an adversarial type of situation, then that damages the marriage itself. Um, but yet, if, if you know that you know that you know that you know that the Lord has asked you to do it, and even your spouse has agreed to do it, um, whew, that comes a different challenge because when you purposely do disobedience and um, it's, and, and I think it also just depends on what it is. Like, for example, my wife and I both agreed that we need to take these classes on how to exercise our eyes so that we can not be so dependent on glasses. Uh, so I bought the class and um, I think I've had the class for two years now and we started to do it a few weeks ago and um, they're like, ah, that, yeah, I don't know what it is. I just don't have the desire to do it because I got glasses. The glasses make me uh, content. They make me complacent. Um, and so it's just, it, you know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, it, we all struggle with laziness to extent. And the, the, that, strong, that scripture, it still amazes me, that scripture, Philippians 4.13, is talking about contentment, yet we use it for so many other things. But it's Christ who gives me strength to be content. So I, I think Paul had a hard time sitting still. <laughs> mm -hmm. Paul was not someone that could just, just be lazy. He was always out about doing the father's business. And so sometimes his, his idea of complacency was just being restrained, you know, as far as being content with the situation that you're in. And he says, whether I'm rich or poor, where it's in plenty or in need, yeah, you know, I've, I've learned the secret to it all is just basically be in Christ, be in the center of his will, and you, you can make it through anything. And I think that's really what, what God's asking us is to, as, a, as married couples, or, or even if you're dating someone, is that, that no matter what, the relationship needs to be always in the center of God's will. So uh, the, we've talked about this before, too is always use the WOOP, W-O-O-P. Uh, if it, let's say the situations that your spouse uh, needs to get a new job. And so that would be the wish. The outcome is you want higher pay, less hours at work and a more fulfilling job. The obstacle your spouse has is that your spouse is working 80, plus hours a week and says they have no time to look for another job. And plus, what if a recession happens and I get this new job, I'll be the first one to let him, let me go. That's, you know, the complaints that the spouse would have. And then the plan would be to share, would be for that per person to share with their spouse what he's looking for or she's looking for. And that spouse who has the extra time could start looking for that new job or hire a headhunter. And if you do go into recession, your current job could let you go too. There's no, there's, you know, you always need to be constantly looking for where God is moving you next and not to be complacent. Be content where you are, but don't be complacent. Uh, that, that would be one of them. I've got some others here, but what, what other advice would you guys give? While you are thinking about that, I'll, I'll give you my, my other ones. Um, yeah, let's say that it's they want new transportation or, or new house. That's what they wish for. And that's what they think God's put on their heart. Outcome, um, you want it, something to be low maintenance and fairly brand new to help you get to where you want to be and stay where you want to stay. Obstacle due to short-term supply shortage of Things are overpriced right now, high interest rate, and my job uh, may not be where the new house is, and I'm looking for a new job, and so, um, and the new job may even provide me with a new car, so maybe this isn't time to buy 
the new house or new car. And so the plan is wait until supply issues correct themselves and I get a new job. Sometimes the, the dream and vision God's put in us has to be delayed because we got to get to step one before we try to get to step two. Uh, want a new church? Well, you know, they can use the excuse we haven't gotten a house yet. So I don't, we haven't found a church because I'm, we're only going to be here temporary. Well, you know, some of the closest friendships I've ever had was from a temporary housing situation called roommates. And I am still close best friends with um, two of my roommates from college. And that was just a temporary time in my life. So, you know, go, finding a church is is sure you can keep on going online and watching all these great churches and it's fun to be just laying in your bed but church is not about um uh, learning it's about learning and connecting with other believers so uh, well the, the obstacle is you know we're, we're we're only here for a temporary period of time and it's well and we don't know which church to go to we'll start make a list of local churches that, you know, ask around at the people, co-workers that you work with, you know, put it on your ca calendar, commit, go to a different church each week, regardless of how you feel, unless you're like grossly sick, you know, if you're just not in the mood, then do it anyways. Um, the other is, um, uh, I wish or want my spouse to be more, more romantic. The outcome, I want to be more physically and more emotionally connected with my spouse. The obstacle is neither one of us are in the mood to be more romantic. So what's the plan? Do whatever it takes to put you guys in the mood and agree to do those things. You know, put a plan in place. So those are some ideas I wrote down that using the wish outcome, obstacle, and plan. But what advice would you give someone who's going through that situation where they feel that their spouse or themselves have become complacent? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, man. Donald, yeah. what, uh, what advice would you you give to a friend that if they asked you, said, yeah, my, mom, my spouse has become complacent. What, what do I need to do? The Lord's asking us to do something, and yet I, I can't get my spouse to, to commit to it or do it. Well, um, I was listening to my brother Dwight, and uh, <clears throat> those are wonderful words of wisdom that the Lord laid on his heart to share with us. Um, when I, you asked the word complacent, and you said in regards to a relationship with a spouse, um, it triggers several different emotions inside of me. Um, And since we study the Bible and we learn through the Bible, through the Word of God, manifested by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> it said they were being fed daily by manna in the wilderness. And they got tired of eating the same old stuff for 40 years that kept them strong and healthy, they um, they wanted leeks and garlic. They remember when they were in Egypt and bondage, the flavor, I guess, uh, manna was, uh, didn't, um, had the same flavor that garlics and leeks gave them. And then, they wanted meat. They wanted fresh meat. So the Lord gave them quail. Um, I, I guess so much quail. They said it came out of their nose. Um, so if my spouse is, um, is not satisfied 
with her spouse. Um, that's a personal issue she has that only God and she can can change. However, saying that is to say this, is there something I can do? And I search myself and honest with myself. Um, then that's something that the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, will reveal to me um, if if I am satisfied with where I am and I'm not willing to to change to meet uh, my loved one's needs then that's something I need to be honest with myself about. Um, yeah, they're saying, you know, uh, if another man's grass is greener on the other side, then maybe I'm not watering my own grass and fertilizing and taking care of my side of the fence. So that's something that's... Um, It's such an interesting question, but it's it's so relevant and today of how many people that I see are always wanting something more than what they have, not realizing what they what God has already given them to them and what what are they doing with what they've already have. Um, so it's it's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. And um, no, that's, that's so true. That's all, I have to say. that's all I have to say about that, brother. No, that's that's beautiful because it it brings up inside of me um, that many times that we're just projecting our own uh, complacency on to. Our, our own frustrations we have for our own complacency, we're blaming it on our spouse. Mm. And, you know, you got to look what you're saying is look at your own situation. Are, are you just sitting at home? Your spouse is working all the time, working 80 plus hours, busting their butt off and, and you're not content because not content. You're you you actually are the one who are who is complacent, even though you want your spouse to do all the work. but you have the time to do the work yourself and and yet you're really upset with yourself and not your spouse i i had that happen one time where i i i, I thought was i was saying to the lord it's the woman you gave me that's the problem and and, and finally um I, he says have you addressed it with an with an Eason? and i did and then then she she didn't have the problem and then so i had all green lights to go and uh found out I was the one with the problem is I was using her in my mind as an excuse to do what, you know, oh, we can't do what, what, what we needed to be called to do because, you know, my spouse wouldn't agree to that. And she's like, no, I, I agree to that. <laughs> I'm like, uh -oh, now I got to get serious about it, you know, so that, and, um, and, and, you know, really it was a fear inside of me to do something. And I was using, my spouse is an excuse that that I can't do what God's called me to do because of my spouse. And it really wasn't my spouse at all. It was really me. So that's a good point, Don, that you really you woke woke that up inside of me. Here. So so Darren, you you wanted to speak to the heart of, of any men out there that that are dealing with the situation or any women out there where they feel that their spouse has become complacent? Well, I certainly do. I relate to it. Uh, I've been married over 20 years. So I think that the topic and even some of the thoughts shared already, I can completely relate to and identify with uh, a couple, couple short ones. Um, 
Number one, to word complacent, if you were to understand the definition, I think it's important. Uh, I think what stood out to me about the definition is that it is an unaware of some potential change or, excuse me, unaware of some potential danger or defect. And I think the key word there is unaware. Uh, that stands out. So we can unpack that a little bit. Uh, the second thing is I want to piggyback a thought on what Don said about the manna. If you think about that with, as that relates to contentment, the story of God seeing his people bread from heaven is a pretty amazing idea. And, of course, they're in the desert, and it's incredible. God's taking care of his people. You have to think, you know, first day, 30 days, wow, those yeast rolls taste awesome. But what about a diet of 40 years of that? Wait a second, I'm, I'm kind of sick of this. Can, can we eat something else? It's lost its appeal. It's lost its newness. It's lost its luster. So what did Israel begin to do? They started to look back. Man, life was better back. Life was better when I was single. Life was better when our marriage was younger. And that's a dangerous place to be. I think the best way to deal with complacency, and this is where the challenges are, and if our wives are on here, it might help. How do you approach the topic? of how I feel. And as a watchman, what I see. One thought about a watchman. Uh, the property that I own, when I first moved in, I realized there is a wood home. The advice was given to me was, well, probe that wood and you can look for rot. But my advice to you is just inspect it every so often. But don't go looking for it. The deeper you probe, the worse it may get. I think a watchman has to inspect and to keep an eye on things, especially in his own uh, household. I think a watchman also has to first look at his own soul. Are you doing a good job shepherding yourself? Are you doing a good job taking care of yourself? Are you being the best husband? Are you being a great king in your home? Are you providing? Are you protecting? Are you a good shepherd? Are you a good leader? Are you a good king? Be a watchman of your home. And when it comes to your spouse, yes, we are watchmen for each other. I just read about Cain and Abel just the other day. Cain had an issue with his brother. He harbored it. Something very ugly. And it eventually led to murder. And if you go to the New Testament application in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus warns us, hey, listen. Be careful with those thoughts you're having. They can, get in, they can become something very, very ugly. And in John's gospel, excuse me, in, the, in the, the writings of John later, John says, you can murder your brother in your heart. So as shepherds, as watchmen for each other and of our own souls, we have to do that. But I don't think we should probe for rot. But carefully. And then figure out how to appreciate the manna in your life. You've been married 40 years, you've been married 20 years, you've been married 50 years. That's incredible. It tastes just as awesome as it always has. Are you in the manna for granted? Two thoughts. Woo. Wow. Mm. Lots of deep meat there. You know, it, it that that reading that definition of, of complacency explains why the Lord put in my heart the city walls. The city walls blind you to what is coming. And, and, and instant death could come upon your family without you even knowing it. And the other thing is, is that pointing out that if you're looking for problems in your marriage, you'll find it. There's always something that you can find that's wrong. But is it is it the type of rot that's going to destroy everything or is it just really as, as my brother, uh, Mike Edwards says to me, when you're pointing the finger at people, you still got three fingers pointing back at you. So yeah. Meaning that the problem many times is within yourself. And then you give that illustration of the watchman, then you took us to the shepherd. 
And you're right. There are times where you get so frustrated that, that you're actually murdering the people that, that you are entrusted to care for and you're murdering them in your heart. And that's not right. You know, you, you've got these lambs that you're supposed to take care of and, you know, and part of you also just wants to kill them. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm, I don't laugh but because it's funny, but it is somewhat how stupid our brains are at times, how stupid we are as humans that here's someone we're entrusted to care for. And yet um, we are so embittered by their complacency or embittered by how God made them different than you that you don't appreciate the reason why God made them different than you. So it is, a, I had advised one spouse, they were so upset about their spouse being uh, unable, you know, we do all this financial planning and yet um, part of the planning was for him to get a new job and, and um, so that he could, would have to work so many hours and, and, um, but she was complaining but what she was really complaining about was his loyalty and if she really looked at it the reason they've been married so long was because of his powerful gifting of loyalty even if it's killing him to be in that job, he still will do that job and will not change because he has a sense of duty that um, that is rare. So um, just food for thought. So I'm, I'm going to wrap us up in prayer and um, thank you guys for all your, your wisdom and insight.